The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is made possible in part by our signature partner, Amgen. Committed to transforming new ideas and discoveries into medicines for patients with serious illness. The following episode is made possible by an independent grant from Merck and Company Incorporated. From Offscript Media, my name is Matthew Zachary, and this is The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship. When I was 21 years old, I had big plans to move to Los Angeles. It was the summer before my senior year in college. I had made some connections in the film industry. I was going to score movies. I'd played piano all my life, majored in it in college. So this dream was actually close to happening. And then I was diagnosed with brain cancer. It rocked my world. So instead of Los Angeles, I found myself in the cancer ward. Even with my friends, my parents, who were, who were right there with me, it was, you know, to say the least, the opposite of what I was hoping for. Eventually, I mean, eventually, I built stuff. I started a website where other young adult survivors could find relevant information, resources, each other. Then I got a radio show called The Stupid Cancer Show off the ground. Hey, hey, kids. It's The Stupid Cancer Show. We are live on the air. The first live streaming radio broadcast giving voice to young adults affected by cancer. I got chills. I got chills. It ran for 14 years. I met some incredible people along the way, and I learned from each one. Advocates became friends. We all wanted to make surviving cancer suck less. I met people like Fitzhugh Mullen, Ellen Stovall, Dr. Harold Freeman, Heidi Adams, Dr. Patty Gans. They worked tirelessly to change how cancer patients survive. If you haven't yet listened to the previous episodes of the Cancer Mavericks, now's the time to check them out because you'll hear about important books like Vital Signs and Planet Cancer. You'll hear the mini biographies about everyday mavericks who educated their doctors, challenged the status quo by asking more about the medical treatments that were both life-saving, but also life-altering. That kind of patient activism takes a lot of work, right? A lot of creative, bold, organized, and brave work. That's why I call them Mavericks. Bit by bit, surviving the disease was talked about. Along the way, celebrities stepped forward, offering their own experiences and advocating for screening and research. They helped break the stigma attached to cancer as well. So in this episode, we're going to La La Land. We're casting our sights on Hollywood and its star power. In 2000, Katie Couric did something unprecedented on national television. Hi, everybody. Here we are uh, in my kitchen. It's about 18 hours plus before I get my first colonoscopy. In an effort to normalize screening for colon cancer, Katie brought viewers of the Today Show along for the whole process, starting with bowel prep the night before, and going all the way into the exam room. Here's my cherry-flavored New Lightly. Looking forward to drinking this in the next several hours. And the instructions say you're supposed to mix it with um, hot water, warm water, sorry about that, and then drink it at intervals of every 10 to 15 minutes, as Dr. Ford said. So I'm going to fill this puppy up. I'm very happy the fill line doesn't go all the way to the top. I was quite relieved at that. 
Okay, now I haven't eaten anything for three hours because my stomach's supposed to empty, and I had a light lunch. I had a turkey ramp. Um, all right, and now let's go to the table and let's potty. Katie sits down with a jug of prep solution and starts cutting a lime like she's about to do tequila shots. Okay, per Dr. Ford's instructions, if you suck on the lime before and after you drink this stuff, it's much more palatable. My first glass. Mm -mm -mm. Looking forward to it. Ooh, here goes nothing. <laughs> well, um, I'm not sure I'd order at a restaurant. She makes a face and holds her nose while her two young daughters look on. Bottoms up, so to speak. <laughs> the next morning, with many, many glasses of new lightly down the hatch, it's game time. From NBC News, this is Today. After the show, I went directly to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital for my date with Dr. Ford. Katie walks into the exam room wearing a terry cloth robe, light blue socks, and a huge smile. Hi, Dr. Hello, Ford. I know, How I'm very you? chipper considering what you're about to do after. to me. <laughs> How are you? How did the preparation go? It went fine. I feel Good. sort of and clean were, as a whistle. And you were able to work this morning? Yeah. The doctor asks if she has any questions. And Katie doesn't shy away from the gory details. Not to be gross, but the go lightly is still like doing its thing this morning. Is that okay? It's okay. It is? It's okay. okay. Then it's time for the IV. I heard you're a little light on the sedation. I, 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 give, no, I, give, I, give, I give you what you need. I give, no, I give you what you need. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> when, okay. When, when you start uh, babbling uh, senselessly, okay, we know that we're okay. If I we're try okay. to pick you up, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> the needle slides into Katie's arm. So this is the medication we're giving you here. What is that? This is Demerol. So you're going to get a little groggy from this, maybe. But it's a nice, relaxing feeling. Okay. I'm a little nervous. Sure, that's... Is that normal? Normal. Very normal. How do you feel? Um, I feel um, very lethargic. I feel the way I feel right before I go to sleep. Right. Okay. And then you see it in all its glory. Katie Kirk's colon right there on the screen. I have a pretty little colon. But you yeah, didn't put the scope in yet, did you? Yeah, okay. we're doing the examination. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, oh, we're doing okay, it. Okay, good. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. We're, all, <laughs> we're doing it. We're almost done. You're going to feel a cramp there now. Yeah, I did. Going around the bend. You can take some nice deep breaths if you feel the crampiness. Try a slow deep breath. Nice and easy. Normal. Those are normal, healthy-looking blood vessels. Katie's awake throughout the procedure. And even under sedation, she's in journalist mode helping her audience understand what's going on. What's at the bottom there that we're seeing? At or the, the bottom? Center, in the center. Uh, it's normal. It's just like when you're driving through a tunnel and your headlights haven't reached a spot. It oh, looks I gotcha. dark, but once your headlights get up to it, you realize that it's clear. That's the, where the small intestine is. And I'm going to clear this fluid up so you see where, if you can see where the appendix takes off. In other words, we're six feet up. We're, we're six feet up there. So. Jeez. That's reassuring, Dr. Ford. Thank you for sharing that point with me. Our colons, <laughs> colons are always, aren't they generally six feet long? Yeah, colons? yeah. So we're at the end of your Even on small people. You're at the end, of, we've reached yeah, the end, end of the colon. Line. End of the line. So we're going to come out now. That's it? We're up to the top, mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. I'll stay up there a little longer. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. So far, I'm looking so pretty far, clean. You're huh? very clean. So we're coming down nicely, and it's as clean as a whistle. This is a perfectly normal examination. Okay, Katie, that's it. That wasn't bad at all. No, no. You know, the only discomfort was really sort of when you blew air in me, I guess. You felt yeah. a little cramping. A little crampy, yeah. Right. But other than other that, no. I didn't feel a thing. Okay, good. You're brilliant, You're Dr. Ford. You're super patient. Thank you very <laughs> what much. What a team. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, guys. Good. And it was normal, which is the most important thing. So no polyps, no, no nothing. No polyps, no cancer, no inflammation, nothing. Back in the studio, dressed in a hot pink sweater, Katie brings out a colonoscope for show and tell. It looks like a flexible black snake outfitted 
with high-tech bells and whistles. We wanted to show you what Dr. Ford was using, a colonoscope. And this is what basically is inserted into your body. And it's a really amazing piece of equipment because they have a, it's, it's attached to a, a power source, but you can move it up and down or side to side. She ends the segment by calling on viewers on to get screened for colon device. cancer. And I just want to reiterate that it really didn't hurt. I felt a teeny bit of cramping and I'm a big baby. So for me to say that, that's a lot. By the way, this is why you need to get tested, because catching those growths before they turn into full blown cancer is what it's all about. For Katie, this issue was immensely personal. Her husband, Jay Monahan, had died of the disease just two years earlier, leaving behind two young daughters. He was only 42 years old. Katie delivered that news to her viewers in 1998. I lost my husband, Jay Monahan, my loving and beloved husband, last month after a courageous battle with colon cancer. Jay's diagnosis came out of the blue. Katie wanted to raise awareness of colon cancer, normalize talking about it, and to get more people to schedule screenings for it. And it worked. After her segment with Dr. Ford on the Today Show, there was a 20% increase in colonoscopies in America. And that's the Katie Couric effect. Eight years later, she helped start Stand Up to Cancer, one of the country's largest cancer research nonprofits. They bring in celebrities to help draw attention and donations. You may have seen one of their telecasts. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the opening ceremonies of Stand Up to Cancer. We're just receiving word that the torchbearers are approaching the theater. And there's the torch. Being this one opens with Melissa McCarthy, Melissa McCarthy and Steve Carell passing a giant torch like they're starting up the Olympic quest to stand up to cancer. The Dave Matthews Band takes it from there. Don't care if I know you can see All the world and the mess that we're making you might have been at a baseball game and heard announcers ask you to stand up to cancer. Tonight, Major League Baseball joins our partner, Stand Up to Cancer, in reaffirming our commitment to the fight against cancer. Since 2008, Stand Up to Cancer has raised hundreds of millions of dollars. That money has funded research. Research that contributed to the development of nine new cancer therapies approved by the FDA, including treatments for bladder, breast, colorectal, ovarian, and difficult-to-treat leukemias in children and young adults. About 2,000 scientists representing more than 210 institutions are involved in the research projects they fund. But Katie Couric didn't get this off the ground alone. Senior producer Mary Rose Madden takes it from here. From heavy dramas to comedies, war movies and romance flicks, Laura Ziskin was a force to be reckoned with in Hollywood. She was known as a top-notch film producer. Her first producer credit came in 1985. That was not a time when women were welcome to run the show. But she was a natural, and she attracted talent and directors. Pam Williams, also a film and television producer, was working for George Clooney when he introduced her to Laura. I always say I fell madly in love with Laura after about 10 minutes of her sitting on my couch. And it dawned on me that I finally knew what I wanted, who I wanted to be when I grew up. Laura became her best friend slash mentor slash hero. I mean, Laura was a mover and a shaker, as they say. She was a studio executive at 20th Century Fox, Fox 2000, and Sony Pictures. She had deals with Warner Brothers, from Pretty Woman to No Way Out to the crown jewel, the Spider-Man franchise. Spider-Man 1 had been a huge hit. Spider-Man 2 was right on the cusp, you know, of let's move it fast, let's get it going. It was 2004, and Laura was at the height of her career, about to set sail on Spider-Man 2. And the cancer diagnosis. Late stage breast cancer. You know, as a producer, you're a problem solver. So she was faced with the biggest problem of her life, which was her survival. I'm mad as hell. Why is my prognosis 
know better really today than if I'd had the same diagnosis 40 years ago. That's Laura Ziskin talking to the American Association of Cancer Research in 2010. I want better treatments. You know, I want answers to my disease, and I believe the answers are out there. AACR is Stand Up to Cancer's scientific partner. I wanted to use the bully pulpit of the media, which is where I live and work. And this is how, even today, 10 years after her death, somehow Laura Ziskin is still a force. Because she didn't want to just do a rah-rah pep rally. She knew the money would come. But she wanted to know what the money would do. If we were going to raise money, how do we not know I'm going to be pissing the ocean? You know what I mean? Not just be a drop in the bucket. How could we actually do something different? For Laura, it wasn't just about what was the number we were going to raise, right? It was where is that money going? Pam, Laura, Katie Couric, and other big names in Hollywood created Stand Up to Cancer with the goal of building scientific partnerships. In order to get their funding, scientists, clinicians, and other experts from various disciplines are contractually obligated to work together. We only give you money if you collaborate. Uh, We call it dream teams, multidisciplinary teams Usually seven, eight institutions across the country or world coming together. And every six months, you have to tell us where the money has gone, where you're at. And if you're not collaborating, you know, we can hold the money back Um, again as the carrot to try to get answers more quickly. It was a unique combination of fundraising and then backing ambitious scientific endeavors. It had the collaboration and the acceleration they were looking for. Stand up to cancer was going to be disruptive. We wanted a cure. Cancer sounds like it's just one thing, but the reality is it's over 200 diseases. It was really interesting, again, as you get deeper into cancer research and you realize cure is the goal, but the reality is some cancers will be cured. There are other cancers that we will have to um, find the long-term answer to live with cancer. Their tagline is making every cancer patient a long-term survivor. On their website, one can search for a support center and they even have a clinical trial finder. Every year, celebrities like Stevie Wonder and Reese Witherspoon step into the spotlight for stand-up to cancer telecasts. Sometimes celebrities are on game shows, and if you're 45 and over, listen up tonight. Colon cancer untreated can take your life. Get it right, get screen. No time to be silent. They even had Chuck D from 80s rap group Public Enemy rap about getting screened for colon cancer. Colon cancer, the black and brown community. No joke, chill on the alcohol, either from the smoke. Realize there's hope, but you gotta catch it early though. Without a health screen, and you won't even know. Get tested, pay attention to the signs. Talk to your doctor and check your behind. Chuck D is part of Hip Hop Public Health, a group of medical experts and others in the rap community. They want their collaboration to have an impact on health inequities. Black people are almost 20% more likely to get colorectal cancer and about 40% more likely to die from it than most other groups. When famous people like Chuck D step out of their norm and speak on a public health issue like cancer, it begs the question, who influences us and why? One thing that's really important to recognize is that so much of the information that we Gets that's relevant for our health isn't from our doctors, from nurses, from other health professionals. Dr. Stephen Hoffman is a professor of global health law and political science at York University in Toronto, Canada. It is from family members. It is from friends. It's from websites and social media. And just media in general. That's where we find celebrities advertising, advocating, or just trying to catch our attention. Celebrities have influence over our behaviors in all sorts of different ways. In one uh, meta-narrative analysis that my lab did uh, and that we published in the British Medical Journal, we really got to emphasize the various ways in which humans are biologically, socially, and psychologically hardwired to follow celebrities' medical advice. 
But of course, not all celebrities have evidence-based science behind them. The Katie Couric effect, that lands on the positive side, according to Hoffman. But he says there have been times when celebrities have stepped into public health messages and it's not been pretty. In the UK, for example, uh, presenter Michael Parkinson um, was uh, speaking um, uh, publicly about um, how, uh, you know, if you have prostate cancer, if you're able to pee on the wall from two feet away, which is a totally bogus way of for men to detect whether they have prostate cancer. Or... Um, Closer to to home, uh, Christina Applegate was promoting uh, MRI um, uh, screening for early detection, but actually the U.S. National Cancer Institute doesn't actually endorse those kind of investigations for people who are at average risk of breast cancer. Okay. Even when celebrities are trying to do right and break the cancer stigma, they can forget that regular people often have high deductibles or have to battle health insurance to cover tests and procedures the celebrities are advocating for. But Hoffman says money problems and healthcare battles, those issues don't have a glossy Hollywood sheen. Poverty is not sexy, and it uh, doesn't uh, add to the celebrity's brand. They might be well-intentioned when they're trying to raise awareness. But they do so in ways that aligns and actually builds their own brands and often advantages them. I don't think that should be a controversial thing. That's just a fact, he says. Celebrities... um, are more wealthy than the average person. And so then the way in which the celebrities are portraying a certain thing might just be impossible for others to to do because of a variety of circumstances that reflect the kind of inequality that we have in our society today. That inequality is significant in a cancer survivor's life. In a recent New York Times article titled Cancer Without Chemotherapy, a totally different world. Medical experts and cancer survivors were assessing the impact new treatments were having on their lives. The survivors interviewed were able to avoid chemotherapy or need far less than others, an option that truly wasn't there 20 years ago. How could they avoid it? The cancer survivors were treated with targeted therapies or immunotherapy, treatments that are given in the form of pills. The article follows doctors as they face the debates involved in veering away from the old school toxic treatments and trying something that had gone through successful clinical trials, but still felt new to the cancer world. Taking the new treatments, the pills, often meant the patients avoided chemo's life-altering effects. But as the article ends, the reader understands that one of these new treatments has a list price of $20,000 a month. And the survivor's co-payment is $1,000 a month for the foreseeable future. This is the kind of treatment that could put someone in financial toxicity, the term given to a survivor's state of life when they're draining their savings, refinancing their home to pay for treatments. There are about 17 million cancer survivors in the United States, more than ever before. But survivorship often has a financial burden. This field touches on so many different aspects of a person and a person's life and their interactions with the healthcare system. That's Dr. Larissa Nekladov. She's a general internist and a primary care physician at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She's also the director of internal medicine for cancer survivors at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. She says it's insufficient to claim success for curing someone when they're left to suffer in many other ways. And there's a real interplay between the physical, the psychosocial, and these financial troubles. The most clear example has to do with with pain. You know, pain is um, commonly experienced by cancer survivors, and that might be related to the cancer itself, the cancer treatment, including the surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Um, And then pain may restrict their physical abilities, um, which then may lead to depression, which may then lead to inability to perform their work which may then lead to uh, financial 
limitations, insurance barriers, um, family dynamics, etc. So um, by not adequately addressing pain, we can then lead to this cascade. She refers to this cascade as the clinical care conundrum of cancer survivors. And for those survivors who do undergo life-altering treatments, curing their cancer might not be enough. But you don't see a lot of celebrities advocating for cancer survivorship issues, she says. Cancer is um, definitely represented in, in Hollywood, but patients either die of their cancer, most likely in Hollywood, or patients survive and then you never hear anything about their late and long-term effects. Every year, more and more people are successfully treated for cancer, but they can be left with that cascade of problems, physical pain, personal financial collapse, debilitating depression, all stemming from cancer. But Hollywood tends to shy away from depictions of cancer's effects that aren't directly associated with the disease. It's death or survival, and not much in between. I mean, that's a lost opportunity. Cancer, in a lot of ways, is something that is uh, a social phenomenon. That's Cami Kosenko, a professor of communication at North Carolina State University. I've been focusing on health communication, primarily how uh, we talk about health with our close relatives and romantic partners. But I've also examined things like how the media talks about health and how media content affects our health behavior. She looks at how cancer is seen by others outside of clinical care. And then what kind of effect this has on the survivor herself. Lately, she's been observing how society is reacting to one rising star in particular. There was a recent contestant on America's Got Talent uh, who went by the stage name of Nightbird. uh, And she is living with uh, terminal cancer. So you're not okay? Uh, Well, not in every way, no. You got a beautiful smile and a beautiful glow Mm -hmm. and nobody would know. Thank you. It's important that uh, everyone knows I'm so much more than the bad things that happen to me. Yes. And uh, I find her posts on uh, social media to be very interesting, but quite a good demonstration of the good coper uh, presentation that uh, people like to see when it comes to cancer survivorship. Uh, what they don't want to see is the bad coper or the person who has mixed feelings about it. The good coper is the good patient, she explains. A good coper presents as hopeful, positive, cheerful. And uh, frankly, that's not an accurate <laughs> description of what life with cancer is like for a lot of people. But that depression, those financial problems, or that raw pain that Dr. Nekhludoff talked about, that might be too much realness for our society. People who present themselves as poor copers are more likely to be stigmatized and treated differently than those who present themselves as being the good coper, the good patient. She says often people turn away from the poor coper. We know that uh, the way in which someone handles their illness can impact how uh, likely someone else is to uh, be there to provide social support and caregiving. Kosenko points to a study where a hired actor called a confederate in scientific studies, was hired to be a good cancer coper and a bad cancer coper. They had the confederate portray different types of coping with regard to cancer and brought participants in and said that this is a person with cancer and they were given the opportunity to speak with them and also bring a chair in to sit down and have that conversation. This is what they found. As the actor became sad, angry, or expressed a hopelessness, the participant moved their chair farther and farther away. Kosenko says you could see stigma manifest simply in how close the chairs were placed. People who present 
as a good coper are more likely to get supportive responses. Uh, They're likely to have friends and family that stick around uh, as opposed to being ghosted, which we know happens quite a bit once someone experiences an illness. The study is called The Role of Coping in Support Provision, The Self-Preservation Dilemma of Victims of Life Crises. There are a few takeaways in this study, but one thing the researchers observed is that by openly expressing their distress, a survivor is very likely to alienate their social network, which can lead to suffering alone, which then leads to more distress. Another survivor's conundrum. How relationships change in times of crisis. How individuals react to a survivor's coping style. Kosenko says, in a lot of ways, cancer is not an individual illness. It's a social one. It has effects on the family. It has effects on people's relationships with others outside of the family. And oftentimes it's managed not by an individual, but by a couple or by a family. Caregivers carry on through the cancer continuum, too. The stress, the pain, figuring out how to pay for it, and, of course, the uncertainty. Milton Kent is a former reporter and sports columnist for the Baltimore Sun, a professor at Morgan State University, and a cancer survivor. Like millions of boys who grew up in Maryland in the 70s, I grew up considering Brooks Robinson and Frank Robinson and Wes Unseld heroes for their adroitness on a diamond or basketball court. But now, well into my 50s, and three years since I was initially diagnosed with stage 3 cancer of the esophagus, my champion has never swung a bat or even dribbled. Nonetheless, she's unbeaten. My wife, Glenda, is my hero. She was there through every chemo session and every round of proton radiation, including the day my trachea tube popped out and the technicians had to call in a doctor to reinsert it. For months, Glenda carried a portable suction unit around for me to ensure that the mucus wouldn't overtake me. She's seen me through repeated trips to the emergency room, a return to the hospital on Valentine's Day, biopsies, and every scan since. She exhausted every bit of her leave from work to be my nurse. Glenda became so good at it that professionals commented that she must have had some sort of medical instruction. She doesn't, but then pure devotion can often make up for training. After the most recent scan, my oncologist walked over to Glenda, patted her on the shoulder, and told her that she was a hero. I couldn't agree more. That was cancer survivor Milton Kent. After the break... We'll hear from a man who played a doctor on television and then had a supporting role in real life when his own mother was diagnosed. Stay with us. Additional support for The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is made possible by the following partners. Bristol-Myers Squibb, Daiichi Senkyo, Merck, Seagen, Takeda, Pharmacyclics, and AbbVie Company, and Janssen. Learn more about these supporters at CancerMavericks.com. Welcome back to the Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship. My name is Matthew Zachary. You know, a lot of times when it comes to cancer survivorship, there's this, this underlying question bouncing back and forth from the survivors to the caregivers. Can I be honest? Can I be honest with you? I'm just not feeling it today. I'm not feeling brave. I'm not feeling like a hero. I'm not up for it. Is that okay with you? So whether or not you're a bad coper or just have a mixed bag of feelings that day, you want so badly to be there to show up for the other person, but you just, you just can't. How will that affect the family? So if I'm an angry survivor. That makes it tougher on you, I know. And it'll push you away, causing both of us to be miserable. But if I'm being honest with you, I'm real angry. 
And as a caregiver, I'm feeling really frustrated with doctors and, and I'm tapped out. Is that too real for you? In this episode, we're talking about cancer advocacy and that Hollywood sheen. But we're also talking about what we do for the people we care about and how we do it. Katie Couric and her husband, Pam Williams and Laura Ziskin. My name is Patrick Dempsey. You might know Patrick Dempsey from his 11-year stint playing Mick Dreamy or Dr. Derek Shepard on the ABC hit show Grey's Anatomy. But in real life, he saw one medical issue through the patient's eyes. My mom was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, so it affected my life profoundly. She had over 12 reoccurrences. She was a fighter. She never gave up. Uh, really, you know, really positive, salty in a good way. That gave her a little bit of an edge. She battled it for a really long time, but she, she was around a lot of people who didn't last, that, you know, that passed away very early. And she had a lot of guilt with that. And also a lot of anxiety, of, okay, this comes back, what am I going to do? How am I going to be able to handle this? When his mother was in the midst of treatments, he opened the Dempsey Center in Maine. It's been going on now for 14 years. Thousands have used the counseling, peer-to-peer groups, and all types of integrative medicine. And all of it is free. I try to get back once a month to touch base, to see what's going on. Dempsey says that even though he doesn't live in Maine anymore, he always makes it back to the center he opened in his mom's honor. There's a love there. The, the boundaries go down. And he learns from every visit. Some days you come in strong, and some days you don't, he says. But there are no expectations. It's so true and sincere and open. You really find power in that for not only the person coming in seeking the help, but the people that are there for the caregiving as well. His sister Mary was the primary caregiver. Mary worked at the hospital where their mom was being treated, so that gave her an inside look. And she really helped us understand what was going on and, and being able to interpret what the doctors were recommending for treatments and things like that. She, so without her, I think we all would have been lost. That feeling of helplessness that caregivers know all too well was humbling. So Patrick and Mary built the Dempsey Center. Did his celebrity status help with that? You bet. In, in all of this fame, all of the, the connections started coming together at, at the right moment in time in order to be able to create something like this. It's brought a sense of depth to his life. I think fame with it in itself is not fulfilling. But when you have something that you're doing that's positive with that platform, then you find something that's really enriching. For years, being a cancer survivor meant you were a fighter or you were brave. There didn't seem to be loads of room to be anything else. But now we are writing our own unique scripts. Being a survivor is about more than just the illness or the cure or the relapse. Survivorship is an art, and the art of your survivorship is how you choose to get busy living. For the Cancer Mavericks, my name is Matthew Zachary. Thanks for listening. The Cancer Mavericks, a history of survivorship, is a production of Offscript Media in partnership with Small Good Thing. The executive producer is Steve Lichtai. Our senior producers are Susie Armitage, Mary Rose Madden, and Andrew McDowell. Our associate producers are Mariah Dennis and Mar Laser. And our production assistant is Sophia Kurzius. Sound design and mixing is by David Schulman, and our music is composed and performed by me, Matthew Zachary. For more information about this series, visit CancerMavericks.com. That's CancerMavericks.com. Thank you.